Philippians chapter 4 is where we find ourselves this morning. So turn there with me. We are coming to the conclusion of this great epistle, and um, we're, we're just, I, I really hope you guys have learned. I know I have, I've just enjoyed studying this book together, and um, I, I'm hoping and praying that God will use his word as we continue to preach through this book, one more sermon, and then we are going, as you know, to the gospel um, according to Isaiah. We'll be in Isaiah. Actually, we have a slide up, Mike. If you could put that up, I don't have it. So we're going to finish up this book next week, and then two weeks from now, we will be in the book of Isaiah. We're calling it the gospel according to Isaiah. Actually, the name Isaiah really tells us a lot about the book. His name means Yahweh is salvation, or Yahweh is working salvation. There are a lot of themes that we see through the book of Isaiah, Uh, wonderful themes uh, of the Messiah, the suffering servant. Isaiah will speak about judgment even and, and the coming of judgment and God's wrath that's being poured out. But he also is such a wonderful uh, theme throughout the book of Isaiah of, of the grand beauty and glory of the coming king, Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it ends, actually, the book ends with this restoration of all of creation. So judgment, wrath, yes, but joy and hope and peace and Messiah and suffering servants. So we'll be in that book for quite some time. So um, I want you to want to encourage you to dust off your Old Testament and look and read through the book of Isaiah over the next few weeks as we jump into that together in, in two more weeks. Um, that's where we're at. But meanwhile, we are in Philippians chapter 4. Bible's in the back, reading from the ESV. Look at verse 14 through verse 19 is our text this morning. Hear the word of God, the infallible authoritative word of God. Philippians chapter 4, verses 14 through 19. Yet, Paul writes, it was kind of you to share my troubles. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left uh, Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I'm well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Verse 19, and may my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word this morning. So as we know, Paul is concluding his letter with a word of thanks. A word of thanks that he's received this gift while in Roman custody, he's chained to a Roman soldier 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And he actually ends the book of Philippians really where he began with a thankful heart. We read in chapter 1, verse 3, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Paul had a thankful heart. But now in chapter 4, Paul becomes a little bit more particular, a little more specific about the, 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 this, this gift that he received. If you remember, Paul, <clears throat> Paul's in Philippi. During his second missionary journey, the Holy Spirit told Paul, you're not going to be preaching in in, uh, Asia anymore, and got a vision, go over to Macedonia, to Europe, to a city in Philippi. He obeyed the call. Now it's 10 years later, he's incarcerated because of the gospel. He's under house arrest. If you're in Roman custody in those days, you needed supplies. They didn't offer you cable TV and and full medical, uh, they actually, you had to feed yourself, clothe yourself, and any other uh, necessities while incarcerated. So Epaphrodites travels 800 miles from Philippi to Rome. All of a sudden I got a scratchy throat. And he shows up with this monetary gift, 10 years after Paul planted this church with the preaching of the gospel. Paul said, we saw last week in chapter 4, verse 10, that this gift that Epaphrodites brought was like a flower's blooming in the spring. Beautiful. And we know that Epaphrodites, when he took this 800-mile trek from Philippi to Rome, we know that he almost died on the trip. We learned that in chapter 3. But God had mercy on him, mercy on Paul, and Epaphrodites lived. And now Paul is writing this letter saying thank you to the Philippian church. He's given it to Epaphrodites, and Epaphrodites is heading back that 800-mile trek back to Philippi. Remember, no cars, no planes, right? He's walking. Boats, walking, whatever they get going, he's going. And we've seen over again that joy 
of the Lord. We saw that Paul is talking about joy a lot. It's a theme of this, gospel, this uh, book, the joy of the Lord. Every theme seems to be wrapped around this concept of joy. Every time Paul pivots from one, one, one theme, one instruction, one encouragement to another, he speaks of joy. As we see in Philippi, uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Chapter 4, verse 10, I rejoice in the Lord greatly. Paul knew that divine joy is centered and grounded in the Lord, not his circumstances, right? We talk about this several times. Not People change. Bad news come and goes. But the Lord remains the same. Happiness is situational, often superficial. Joy is sustained and secured in Christ and the gospel. We are the blood-bought children of God. We are saved from the wrath of God. And now because we have union with Christ through the blood of Christ, we have this promise that God is working all things out together for his glory and our good. Paul trusted God. Paul rejoiced in the Lord and in the gospel. In fact, if you remember in chapter 3, Paul said, I, I counted all those things that, that I, I thought was just going to get me into heaven. I counted all of them, and really it came to absolutely nothing, human excrement, to dung. What I needed was an alien righteousness, a righteousness that apart from my own works, but the work of Christ, that, that by faith in the righteousness of Christ. And, and this gospel, truth of the gospel, is, is a key to joy, but it's also a key to contentment. In verses 10 through 19 of chapter 4, Paul is saying, and I have to say, wonderfully and very delicately, saying, thank you for the gift. Thank you for this gift. At the same time, Paul is teaching us something about contentment. You got to have joy in order to have contentment. And contentment and joy, they kind of run together. Paul begins in chapter 4, verse 10, saying that contentment Contentment, very important we get this. He's not denying he has needs, but he says that contentment, our heart can only be content when it's resting in the sovereignty and the providence of God. Okay? You cannot have contentment. You cannot have peace. You will not have joy unless your heart, not just your mind, your heart is settled on the sovereignty of and the providence of God. God has the ultimate authority, ultimate power, and right to govern and manage everything, all of life, every circumstance, every situation toward his holy and wise and good purposes. Everything. Providence is how he works it all out in all circumstances. Nothing's outside the providential and sovereignty of God. Not the election, not the struggles you're in, the struggles you faced, the hardships, the difficulties. God is working his sovereign providence in all things. No plan B with God. Unless you understand that and embrace it, you'll never have contentment in your life. I rejoice, he says in verse 10, in the Lord. Very important. And Paul, because he rested in the sovereignty and the providence of God, could speak of the things that he needed from a place of contentment. Not that he didn't have needs, but, but he's resting in the providence and sovereignty of God. I rejoice in the Lord greatly, verse 10, that now at length you revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, why? I have learned in whatever circumstance or situation I am content, he says in verse 10. Being content in God's providence made it possible for Paul not to demand a gift or get angry and manipulate the, this church from giving him what he needed. He was able to be thankful and still rest in God's providence in his life. Contentment, he said, is learned. Look at with me, chapter 4, verse 12. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In every and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Contentment is a learned experience as we uncover and discover this relationship with God and all that God has provided for us. 
But we said last week in verse 13 was the secret of contentment. He says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is what Paul is saying as we jump into verse 14. Very important you see this. God is sovereign. And, 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 and what Christ has summoned him to do, the work that God has given him to do, God will give him the provision and the strength to do it. What God has given Paul to do, God will provide the strength and the provision to do it. So contentment then comes to the one who's confident in the, in the sovereignty of God, in the providence of God, who is satisfied with little or much, who's not, in the, you know, not dependent on circumstances, recognizing that the strength to do what God has called him to do comes from God himself. And now, look at your text. Look at, look at verse 10 through 13. You could read that text and walk away at verse 13 when Paul says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, and think that Paul is not really very appreciative of the gift, right? Hey, hey you know what? I, I learned to be content. I've had a lot. I had a little. I appreciate the gift. But you know what? I'm resting in God. God's going to give me the strength to get through everything. Almost as if, like, you know, you kind of wasted your trip. I'm sorry to tell you, Epaphrodites. Paul doesn't want them to think that. So with the, backdrop, uh, with the backdrop of divine contentment, Paul talks to them directly about this gift within the context, listen, of ministry. Of ministry. Partnering in the work of the gospel. Just two points today. The work of gospel ministry and the blessing of gospel ministry. Yeah, you know what I have? Them. It's just, I'm good. Yeah, thank you though, Chris. I won't be able to preach. That'll be really all over. Yeah, my throat just got scratchy. Uh-oh. It's winter time. Welcome to New York. Anyway, okay. The work of gospel ministry and the blessing of gospel ministry. The first thing Paul mentions to them is how their gospel partnership, look at, look at me in verse 14 and 15, was a giving and receiving ministry. Verse 14 again. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. You Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Now the phrase, it was kind of you, literally means you've done a beautiful thing. You have, you have done a noble de- a thing. You've done a, a lovely deed. If you remember Mark chapter 14, Mary of Bethany comes to Jesus with a, with a, in, a, in his room with an alabaster uh, flask of ointment, pure nard, it's nard, uh, very costly, and she breaks it and she pours it over Jesus' head, if you know the story, Mark 14. Some people got angry. Why are you wasting this ointment, they said. It could, it could have been given to the poor, sold, and, and 300 denarii we could have got for it. And they scolded her, it says, Mark 14, 5. Jesus says, leave her alone. I just love that. You know, we're talking 2,000 years ago. These guys were all ganging up on this girl. And Jesus steps in and says, leave her alone. He didn't say, leave her alone. I don't think so. Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? Then I would add a few other things. But that's all he said. She has done a beautiful thing. That's what Paul's saying here. You've done a beautiful thing. You, it was kind of, it was a beautiful thing. The word share is the word koinonia again, koinonia. It's not just fellowship. We talked about this when we got in chapter 1. It's not just having coffee together, fellowship. That's not what this means. Koinonia, like in chapter 1, verse 5, is this joint participation, this, this gathering together, this, this working together in the demonstrating and declaring of the gospel. In fact, the word share here, there's a preposition added to it, and it really stresses, Paul is stressing this deep partnership that he feels as they were, as they, they head in the same direction. That's what that word means. And the word trouble is affliction and tribulation. So when you put all this together, Paul says, listen, what you did was beautiful, was lovely, what was noble. You met my daily needs. You expressed not only the Philippians' love to Paul, but they viewed it as, Paul viewed it as this, this partnership, this, this affiliation, this, this uh, time together where we work together, even in affliction, even in sorrow, even in trouble. 
sharing hardships and trouble and walking together through it as we, as we seek the face of God brings a camaraderie and a certain love relationship between brothers and sisters, does it not? Does it not? Heartaches, hurts, as we walk together, seeking the face of God together, it, it, there's this level of love that, that nothing else can bring but that. They were converted through the ministry of Paul. Paul shared this need that they had, that is the, the preaching of the gospel, for their salvation. And now Paul gets this material blessing that meets his need. When, when we give to gospel ministry, it's not just a financial need, the material need, although it's that. There's a spiritual and emotional component to it. We see it here. They were partners with Paul. In fact, it says that they were the only church in Europe that joined Paul in his missionary adventures. They, their giving showed their love for Paul and the fellowship, this, this camaraderie, this joint participation that they had with him. To them, it was a joint business. It was a, it was a gospel adventure. If you're not giving, you're not a partner. If you're not giving to gospel ministry, you're not a partner with gospel, gospel ministry. More of a consumer, more of a customer. But Paul doesn't view the Philippians as customers. He sees them as co-laborers. They, they got skin in the game, as they say. They supplied the needs of Paul so that he could minister freely. They understood that giving of a material need that he had communicates to him not only their love for Christ, but th this gratitude toward him. He must have beamed with joy as they sees this gift arrive. The Apostle Paul spent time with the Philippian church teaching them, I'm sure, of these things. And he understands how, what, 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 a, what a wonderful fatherly joy he must have had to see his children walking in truth. When we give our finances to God's people for God's work, it does communicate gratitude thankfulness, and companionship as we partner together in the work of God. I know when we talk about money, it turns some people off. Some pastors don't like to talk about money, and other pastors, that's all they talk about is money. Send me that seed money. I'll get the handkerchief, the pinky ring. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I say it all the time. The wife looks like he got beat up with a paintball gun. But um, they're talk, but... Regardless of that, bad press, sinful people should not deter us to talk about finances and giving to gospel ministry. I, I'm not here to coerce you. I'm not here to swindle you. I'm not here to, say, dump your, your savings. Our passage today is just dealing with the financial gift that Epaphrodites brought to Paul. So we need to talk about your favorite topic, your money. The church, as we will see, gave out of their poverty for gospel mission. I think, I think it's whenever, whenever we deal with because we go through verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through books of the Bible, we're going to talk about money uh, when it comes up. And I think part of the problem, and you can disagree with me, that's okay, and you, you talk to Jesus about it. I think part of the problem that we don't like to talk about money is because it reveals too much of really where our hearts are at. That's my observation. Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Reminds me of a, of a pastor who was in a rural community, stopped by a farmer, hadn't seen in a while. And he asked the farmer, he said, if you had $200, would you give the Lord $100 of that 200 He said, absolutely. He said to the farmer, if you had two cows, would you give one cow to the Lord? Absolutely. He said, now if you had two pigs, he said, hold on, pastor, you know I got two pigs. The work of the gospel ministry is not only giving and receiving gospel, but it's, it's about spiritual fruit. It's about giving and being partners with someone. Look at it again, verse 15 you, and 16. You Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church partnered with me. Giving and receiving you alone. Verse 16. Even in Thessalonica, you sent help for my needs once and again. Okay. Paul received from the Philippian church as he parted Macedonia, and he went, I think it's 95 miles along the Ignatian Way, 
down to Thessalonica. Now, if you read Acts 17, you'll see where he goes from Acts 16, where he preached the gospel of Macedonia and Philippi. And then he goes to Acts 17, you see where he's in um, Thessalonica. It wasn't a fun time for the Apostle Paul. <laughs> it wasn't a fun time. Paul and Silas were only there for a couple of weeks, and it started a major stir in that city. It says, Paul went into the synagogue, he reasoned with them with the scripture, he explained according to the word of God that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer, rise from the dead, saying, Jesus, to whom I proclaim is the, is the Christ. Some came to faith, and then they formed a mob, and they went to the house where Paul and Silas were, and they attacked the owners of the house. It got so bad that they had to tell Paul and Silas, look, get out of town, and they had to pay off the people, leave them alone. You read about it. And they go from Thessalonica to Berea to Athens and then down to Corinth. In fact, Paul writes this to the Corinthian church about this gift that Epaphrodites brought. 2 Corinthians 11. When I was with you, talking about being at the Corinthian church, and I was in need, I did not burden anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you, burdening you in any way. What did the gift that they brought from Philippi to Corinth to Thessalonica do for Paul? It supported the work of the ministry. Many people were coming to faith. Churches were being planted. Sins were being forgiven. People were becoming Christ followers. When we sow material gifts of the work of the ministry, we share in the spiritual harvest. Material giving reaps spiritual fruit. Now, we are not going to know on this side of heaven all that's going on with Care Portal and the lives that are being changed. We won't know all that's going on. Papua New Guinea, I, we have a list of... of uh, Chris, Chris gave me a list. It's just it's hard to remember all 12 of them. But we have, we have a lot of gospel partners. We have the Pashels in Budapest, Joshin Farms in Zambia, Africa, West Asia, Tokyo, Tajik, Alpha Pregnancy, Engage Albany, Justice for Orphans, Terra Nova North, Capital City Rescue Mission. We have, we'll never really know, but God knows. And when we partner with them, we are partnering with them. We are sharing in the spiritual fruit of our partners with one another in gospel ministry. As you give to Care Portal, as you give to the local global partners in ministry, we share with them in the harvest. You need to be reminded. I need to be reminded of that. It's not only a, a gospel ministry, not only a giving and receiving ministry, going and reaping fruit ministry. It's also, look, a growing and investing. It's about investing in the ministry. In verses 15 and 17, Paul on purpose, right, uses two business terms as he's talking about giving gospel ministry, a money market kind of uh, description. In verse 15, when he says in giving and receiving, he's saying, uh, he's comparing his spiritual work, the, the work of church planting and preaching and teaching as an apostle to them, and the giving of the gift of the Philippian church that they gave him. The picture is, there's this business ledger where Paul is giving and, and teaching and preaching and a credit and a debit column of them giving to the work of the ministry. The church was indebted to, the, to Paul as he gave ministry to the church over and over. And, and now they have given him what was lacking the second term in verse 17, he says, not that I seek the gift, I seek the fruit that increases to your credits. Very interesting word. The word credit has to do with like um, when you have uh, interest. You, 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 you have this credit, this, this added money, this accumulation. Paul's talking about the credit in eternity. Paul did not seek the gift itself. Notice he's doing? He's, he's, he's saying I, it's going to give a blessing to you as your credit in heaven is increasing. He sees beyond just a gift. He sees the, the work of the gospel ministry and the money they're giving. He's serving the church. You see, Paul is so content 
Paul is so content in the sovereignty and provision of God in all the circumstances that God's providence brought him into that he's not even coveting their gifts. He's, he's coveting what the gift is doing to their account. You see that? What a, what, a, what a wonderful gospel motive that is. The fruit increasing to your credit. Gospel-centered, Christ-centered motive to give. Building treasures in heaven. Luke chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus says this. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions, give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old. With a treasure in heaven that does not fail, there are no, need, no thieves approach and no moths destroy. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Do you know that you have an account in heaven? Do you realize that there's a heavenly account that is being credited to you, to the work of gospel ministry? Material giving expands your heavenly account. It's Paul, as a pastor, and, and, and us too, I'll get to that in a minute, but is concerned and wants to teach them not just about monetary giving, but giving with their eyes on the Lord, giving so that they're sending it ahead. That's so important. That, that, that this, this, this gospel venture is, is paying an everlasting rewards. What about you this morning? That's between you and the Lord. I'll leave it to the Holy Spirit. But what does your pocketbook, what does your checkbook, what do your investments say about gospel ministry? How, how does your investing in gospel ministry compare to your earthly account? Paul is thankful, but Paul is showing us and showing them that the work of gospel ministry, this, this generosity he's giving, is really about partnership and seeing the beauty and the glory of the gospel being proclaimed. Now, if that's the ministry of the Philippian church, that this giving, this, this beautiful re receiving and giving and, and, and just serving the Lord, then Paul says that verse 18 and 19 is for them. I want you to see that as we move to the next point. In other words, the Philippian church was a giving church, sacrificial church, they, they, they were doing the work of the ministry. Then Paul writes in verse 18, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, received from Epaphrodites, the gift you sent, fragrant offering and sacrifice, acceptable and pleasing God, and then my God will supply all your needs. What's interesting about this blessing of ministry that's going on here in the church is that Paul is saying, you've given, and now we have this promise. In fact, he uses another business term. Paul says this, uh, I have received full payment, and I'm well supplied. I'm, I, what he's saying is, I, I have received everything, I've got everything I need, and I've got more. I am overly supplied. I have, I'm full, I am at present completely full. A wonderful description of the plentiful that God has provided through the church to Paul. He's, they've given more than he ever thought. Received exceedingly more than he ever expected. Now, I want to put this in perspective. So if you have a Bible, I have it on the screen, but turn in your Bibles, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. You say, well, you know what? The Philippian church, maybe they were flow, you know, rolling in dough. They had Tons of money. All you people have all kinds of money. You should give to the work of the ministry. Well, look what it says. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, writing to the church of Corinth. <clears throat> we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. God's grace is upon the church of Philippi, Macedonia. For in what? A severe test of affliction... Their abundance of joy. Sound like a contradiction? It's not. Their severe test of affliction, there is an abundance of joy. And their extreme poverty that overflowed in bitterness and hatred toward God. 
No. Test of affliction, abundance of joy, extreme poverty, overflowed in wealth and generosity on their part. Okay, get that perspective. Wrap that around your brain. That's the church of Philippi. Begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord. Important. And then by the will of God to us. (laughs) Ah. Extreme poverty. Now, I'm not bringing this up that everyone should take this vow of extreme poverty, right? That's the other extreme. But these verses may reveal our hearts, our idols, may reveal the sinful attitudes that we ought to give to gospel ministry, that our hearts are being revealed, that maybe we need to be more generous. And, and, and what's so cool about this passage, too, is that this church gave out of, out of severe affliction, out of, out of extreme poverty and joy because it was an act of worship. Look what Paul writes. Fragrant offering, <laughs> a sacrifice, acceptable and pleasing to God. The way our hearts will change to be more generous is worship. Is worship. In fact, the word fragrant offering sacrifice, uh, pleading to God, is from the, uh, the Septuagint. The, uh, it, not from the Septuagint, but it, it, Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint. Those same Greek words were used in the Old Testament time of the sacrificing, the sacrificial system, burnt offerings and stuff of that nature. Paul tells us that God is well pleased at our sacrificial giving. God is uh, giving is plentiful, giving is, is pleasant aroma, giving is personal as a way of worship to God. Paul wrote to the Roman church, you know the verse, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is a spiritual service of worship. Romans says, look, give your bodies over to God as, a, as an act of spiritual worship. Here he used the same language. He says, give Financial support to gospel ministry as an act of worship. And when we give to gospel ministry, we're given ultimately to Jesus, right? When we talk about worship, I, I, I like to mention this because when you ever go to another church or you visit another church or someone tells you, you know, how is the worship? I'm like, what do you mean? I, I like to say, what you, they're talking about the music, right? And how's the worship? I'm like, yeah, well... It's a very narrowed view. We call Pastor Ricky the, the pastor of art, music and art, right? Because we, we don't want everyone to think, all right, the worship, let's start the worship, let's sing, and then the worship's over. Worship, prayer, reading scripture, singing, serving, giving, all that we do together as, as the people of God. The music, the prayers, the preaching of the word, the giving of tithes and offering, all is an act of worship. All is an act of worship. Worship is a lifestyle. It's not a song. Right? And this beautiful description that Paul's using in worship, he's likening it back to the Old Testament with, with, this, with this burnt offering, this pleasant aroma, this, this, this smoke filled from the sacrifice, pleasing to God. As, as people are, are consecrated to him and, and serving him and worshiping him. And he says, you know what? Paul teaches here that believers that give to gospel ministry generously and sacrificially is like this burnt offering over and over and over, pleasing to God. Hendrickson in his commentary says this, the the apostle credits the givers with the proper spirit. That is the attitude of faith, love, and gratitude. He acknowledges that their deed was not merely an act of sympathy shown to a friend in need, but a genuine offering presented to God to promote his cause, and thus Paul as God's representative. That made the deed so grand and beautiful, end quote. As the Apostle Paul and all the, all the pastors and elders here, there's, there's a responsibility we have to, to help you in any way we can for you to grow spiritually, to you, for, for us to show you and us and, and as the pastor elder team to invest 
in, eternally and to worship God appropriately. We want to see you grow in all areas of your life. And that includes financially giving as well to the work of the Lord. Doesn't mean we need to know everybody's salary. We're trying to get, well, kind of give up your money. You don't want to talk with each and every one of you. We're not saying that. But let the Holy Spirit work in your life. Are you worshiping God with your finances? Are you worshiping God with gospel ministry? Giving faithfully and generously pleases the Lord. We should give because we want to worship God. We, we should give to gospel ministry because we get to. We get to worship. We get to offer that which belongs to him anyway. Now, you can't write a check and get into heaven. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. You can't score points by writing a check. We're unpleasing God in that sense. We've been, been redeemed by grace alone, through faith alone. We've been rescued and saved from the wrath of God and the righteous judgment of God, not in order to be redeemed, but because in order to be redeemed or, 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 or to be rescued and saved. We're, we're saved by grace. So we're not writing a check. We give as a response to the gospel, the work of God, the grace of God. Listen, nobody can give in this church greater than Jesus gave. For your salvation. Jesus is the greatest giver of all. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9. For you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich. In glory with the Father. He for your sake became poor. Stepped out of glory. Took on human flesh. Went to the cross. So that you by his poverty might become rich. And he ain't talking about finances. It's an act of worship. We get to give. We get to give. Last week, <laughs> we looked at the, I think, probably the worst, the, the, the most misquoted verse of all scripture, right? Verse 13, I can do all things with Christ give me strength. If there was number two, verse 19 would be it. Look with me, verse 19. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory, in Christ Jesus. Really? So I have a blank check? God's going to meet all my needs? Everything that I want, God will give me? That's not a promise for prosperity and luxury. It's not a promise that you could just take what God has given you and waste it. The conjunction actually in verse 19 begins with and should be and then. In other words, if you honor me with, with gospel generosity, when you are a, a person who gives to gospel ministry according to the, to the truth of the gospel, and you are generous, then this promise is for you. Do you see that? You can't claim this promise and cling to all that you have. You can't just say, you know what, God's, I got this going on, and God, according to this verse, he's just going to give me what I need. That's not what this verse is saying. That's not the context of this verse. There, it's been said that there are three types of givers. The flint giver, to get anything, you got to bang them with a hammer, and you only get chips and sparks. The sponge giver, you got to squeeze them real hard to get anything. Or the honeycomb, <laughs> with all its sweetness dripping that's how God gave to us in the gospel. And that's how we should give. The Philippian church was the honeycomb. Paul didn't squeeze them. It was unnecessary. They overflowed with thanksgiving and, and joy and contentment and, and, and hope in the gospel and worship. And God will supply all their needs. But notice what he says. According to his riches in Christ Jesus, in glory in Christ Jesus, Paul did not say out of his glorious riches, but according to his glorious riches, right? Not, not, not out of, but according to. So in other words, if Bill Gates came to your house today and said, I want to give you some money, you're like, hold on, let me get the wheelbarrow. And then he pulled out his wallet, he took out all his money, and he gave you a dollar bill. He said, here you go. Be kind of cheap, but let's say he did that. That's out of his riches, but what if he said, all I have is yours? 
God's promise to meet all our needs according to his vast resources, which he makes completely available to us. If I had $10 million and I gave you out of my riches, I might give you a check and put 50 bucks. But according to my riches, here's all that you need. Believers cannot comprehend the glorious riches of Christ. They're limitless, infinite to meet all our needs. Not all our wants and not all our greeds, but all that Christ has called us to do. For, for those of us who are generous and giving like the Philippians can treasure this promise that God will supply. Those who are generous and giving and like the Philippian church can trust God in God's provision. But those who hold, those who grasp, those who won't give, those who cling to the treasures of this earth, rather than sending some of that home, can't cling to this verse. I think Kent Hughes nails it in his commentary. He says this, On the basis of this, we can proclaim to every generous believer that God will meet every need he or she has. But to the grudging, there's no such solace. The wholesale application of this great promise does not exist It is for the generous follower of Christ alone. So, what kind of giver are you? What kind of giver am I? Do you expect God to meet all your needs but refuse to give to gospel ministry? Or you you have experienced not only growth in the area of giving, but you have actually given in abundance and generosity and have been just amazed And can testify how God has supplied over and over and over again your needs being met because of your generosity for gospel ministry. That's my hope for us today. So you you close the curtain around your heart between you and the Lord. Nobody's going to call you. We're not checking your account. We're not pulling up 2020 financial report on what you gave. Let the Lord do his work in you. Out of the gospel, God has given us everything. All the riches seated with Christ in the heavenlies are we given out of that abundance. Let's pray. Father, thank you. It's a hard word, but it's a freeing word. Lord, we want to see many here locally and globally come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether it is through delivering beds, caring for children, demonstrating that gospel, looking for opportunities to declare that gospel and just showing people the love of Jesus, or it's in Budapest or or Tajik, wherever it is, Lord, we pray that we can be people who are Generous because you've been generous to us. Lord, overflowing in our generosity because of your overflowing generosity in the gospel to us. Help us see our partnership as one of, of, of not only partnership, but the sharing and the fruit of all that you're doing for your glory, Lord, for your glory alone. So speak to our hearts. Help us to see the beauty and glory of Christ and give out of joy and abundance of all that you've done for us, we pray. In Jesus' good name.